whether it's ticketing, merchandising, digital engagements, our website, our apps, there's a lot of information that's coming through. And then we're trying to figure out how do we tie all this together so that we have that clear understanding of that single view of our customers across these touch points. And I don't think this is just a sports industry challenge, right? I think it's a challenge across all industries that manages consumer information. We are fortunate to work in an industry where fans are more willing to share their data with us. But I do think that there's the same expectations do come along, which is I'm giving you something and in return, there's an expectation. Obviously that you will protect my data and store it safely, but also that now you're going to enrich my experience with you somehow. Welcome to The Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. There's nothing like watching your favorite sports team live and in person. The roar of the crowd, the smell of the concession stand, the suspense of the game clock winding down to its final seconds. But would you have guessed that behind every ticket purchase, box of Cracker Jacks, and Jumbotron moment, there are teams of data professionals working to make your fan experience even more seamless and engaging? Joining Cindy today to discuss the data and analytics powering our favorite sports events are Jay Riola, the SVP of Strategy and Innovation for the Orlando Magic, and Charlie Shin, the VP of Data Strategy and Analytics for the Indianapolis Colts. With perspectives from both the NBA and the NFL, Jay and Charlie explore the evolution of mobile ticketing, challenges with identity management, the importance of building fan trust, and the most surprising insights they've ever discovered within their data. All that and more on today's episode with Jay Riola and Charlie Shin. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot, the modern analytics cloud company. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for anyone to analyze your company's data with search and AI. Business people from companies like Walmart, Hulu, Schneider Electric, Cloud Academy, and Mercado use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. You can learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. This week on The Data Chief, what could be a better combination, sports and data? Charlie, Jay, welcome to The Data Chief. Hi, Cindy. Thanks for having us. Hi, yeah, thank you. Good to join you. So, Charlie, where are you joining us from? I'm currently joining from the practice facility of the Indianapolis Colt in Indianapolis. Okay, and I'm loving the background there. So, Indianapolis, but a longtime New Yorker, New Jersey person, right? Yes, I've lived, I actually grew up in Jersey, uh, lived there for many years, uh, back and forth. I've actually uh, lived quite a bit in South Korea as well and worked there for a couple of years, and then having to come back to finish my master's in sports and then joined Major League Soccer, where I spent about 15 years uh, in, uh, in Manhattan. Yeah. So I'm picturing Major League Soccer to football. Are you like the, the current version of Coach Lasso? I don't know if you've been, been binge watching that. I am. It's it's funny because I do come across some of the occasions where you know I'm I'm kind of referring to the to the football field as as a as a pitch or you know referring to the game as a match and everyone's kind of coming back to me and correcting me that hey no it's a game not a you know not a match so <laughs> still getting used to it and adjusting uh, to the, uh, the the new environment here. Oh, good, Charlie and Jay. So from beautiful Florida, long time at Orlando Magic. Where exactly are you joining us from today, Jay? Yeah, hi, thanks, Cindy. So I'm actually joining you from my home office um, in right outside downtown Orlando. So not not in our corporate offices today, but we have a game tonight. So I'll be traveling to the arena as we take on the Atlanta Hawks tonight. Okay. Um, but yeah, happy happy to be in sunny Florida where... Um, don't know what the weather is where you guys are, but it's a nice 75 degrees with some humidity down here today. So oh, no, you're, you're, you're killing us. Cause we'll probably air this in <laughs> January. In, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll both be cold, but that's okay. Well, both of you have had such interesting journeys into the sports field. Um, and I, I guess I'll start with a broad question. A lot of people, um, maybe who don't know the data world haven't believed in the value of data in in terms of sports 
if you think about the book Moneyball and later the movie, do you think that really was the beginning of when the sports industry really said, hey, this will help us? What, what do you think? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to kick off. For, for me personally, it, it was. It, it really, truly was that book. So I, I attended uh, undergraduate at a small school in San Antonio, Texas. I was a Division three basketball player was always passionate about sports, played sports, uh, realized that I was not destined for a long-term career in sports. And so like a lot of people who work in sports business, wanted to find a way to take the passion that I had for sports and turn it into something more. And um, while I was in school was when the book Moneyball came out by Michael Lewis. And I remember reading it and just kind of it opening to my mind to how sports teams could think about their business differently, uh, not just on the court, but um, on the business side as well. And so I, I interned with a number of different organizations while I was in school. I did an internship in Kroenke Sports, which is um, a, a kind of a sports conglomerate in Denver where I'm from. I interned with the San Antonio Spurs. And then ultimately when I graduated, I wanted to find a role that I felt like touched on some of kind of that new age aspect of using data and analytical and quantitative thinking to help guide um, a corporate strategy in sports. And what the closest I could find at the time in 2006 was a role, an intern, another internship role, but a role with the magic that was focused on a, a new arena project, which is now Amway Center. And we've been in for a, over a decade, but at the time was focused on you know, kind of building a new arena and how could we use this uh, new facility to grow our fan base, uh, deliver a better product, um, generate new revenue streams. And so for me, that was the closest at the time that really was kind of a data and analytics role. And it's evolved much further, you know, over the last 15 years in my, my time with the team. But for me, that, that book was kind of, you know, very formative and kind of opening my mind and seeing what the future could hold for me personally and the industry that, that we're in. Yeah. Great, Jay. So from fan, from player <laughs> to actually using data um, as a business, what about you, Charlie? So it, it, it's interesting because, you know, prior to joining in, in, into the sports industry, I've worked in as a consultant for other industries like consumer product goods or uh, technology uh, companies, just, consulting their uh, business models and their growth. And when you look at some of the trends um, outside of sports and how those industry has evolved, you know, they first uh, focused on discipline around the product excellency, right? So there were a lot of investment being made into the development of the product. And that's where all of the focus was. And then you see how they evolve, where they recognize a lot of the technology and a lot of their product have become more of a commodity and more competition came into the market and their discipline of focus has transitioned into consumers and their experiences. So naturally you've seen a lot of companies focus from a product over to customers. Now, if you take that perspective and you look at into the sports industry, I think very similar um, things were taking place where, you know, in sports, they started off of focusing on the product, which is the on-field performance, our players. So a lot of the emphasis was, using data to um, optimize their investments, uh, enhance their quality of on-field performance. But as the competition grew, same thing in sports where we're seeing other entertainment options, there are other sports options, other ways to consume and participate. Now we've seen a shift where the focus is more on the customers and their experience in, in addition to the on-field quality. So a lot of that shift have now moved over to the business side where, you know, we're like Jay, myself, we're using data to think about how do we better understand our customers? How do we deliver better experience for our customer and increase that value for their customers? So I think we're seeing a very similar trend uh, in sports. We're a little bit behind than some of the other industries have kind of gone through that. Um, but I, I think we're on the right track. And for me personally, uh, it wasn't the, uh, uh, the, the money ball, but it was actually Jerry Maguire that got me interested in 
the uh, the sports. Um, and you know, when I was going to school, we didn't have a sports management as a as a, a, a program or or major. You know, I've majored in business, and then uh, doing the consulting, and I just came across. Uh, Jerry Maguire, as well as I was part of the, uh, I've happened to be at the World Cup in 2002 in South Korea and just saw the the magnitude of and the impact that it had on the community. And that just sparked uh, my interest in wanting to get into sports. Um, so that's how I got in. But definitely data uh, and analytics is at the center of the industry uh, at this point. Yeah, so, um, so fascinating. And I think this is where I actually refer to Jerry Maguire a lot too, because I talk about how there's often a failure in our industry to align to business outcomes. And I love Jerry Maguire, Tom Cruise saying just, or it's uh, Cuba Gooding saying, show me the money. It's really about show me the money. And, and I think this remains the thing. So both of you talked about your customers, which are really the fans. And so let me confirm, because when we talk about sports analytics, there is the player analytics, what's, or the field, what's happening on the field, which there's a lot of data here, increasingly with sensors and shirts and, um, the video and cleats and what have you. And then there's the data for the customers or the fans. Are you looking at just one side, the operations, or are you also looking at the player side? Well, uh, for me, it's focused on the business side, but the usage of data could span into the player data or the competition data to support the experience of our customers. And and, um, so that in that perspective, we do touch across all of the data. It's just in how is that data being used for the purpose of driving that customer experience versus you know, my counterpart across the uh, hall here will be focused strictly on using that data to improve the performance and the output of, of the, uh, the game and on-field uh, uh, results. Okay, so you can pay, you at least strategize together, but it's kind of two domain use cases. Is yes. that right? Okay, great. What about you, Jay? Yeah, so I, I would say our role to Charlie's is very similar. Um, my, my team is really tasked with using data analytics, marketing technology to improve the business side of the organization. And I have a counterpart who lives within our basketball operations who is using the same analytical tools, um, you know, maybe is, is sharing some infrastructure elements, but whose responsibility is on informing decisions around draft, coaching, scouting, player management and those types of things. But I think Charlie brings up a great point, which is um, on the business side, obviously we have data and systems that are entirely on our side of of that coin. So ticketing, our mobile app, our point of sale systems, you know, social media data. Uh, But we also are more and more using uh, data that may come from Cindy, what you mentioned, which is capturing data around the on-court game itself. So using data to inform, um, you know, things that can be interactive fan engagement solutions that, that, you know, inform you about what's happening. Like how far did a player run during the course of the game or how many contested rebounds did a player have, which isn't going to be in the basic box score but can be used to enhance a fan's understanding of our team performance of the game and engage them in new and different ways. And I think that is a new and emerging area to the business side is, and Charlie, I think um, spoke to this well, you know, that really kind of became cutting edge on the, the bas- on our side, the basketball side and kind of informing the basketball strategy, but now is coming to be more commonplace in how fans are thinking about engaging or how teams are thinking about engaging their fans um, in new and exciting ways. Yeah. And I, I feel like I should reveal, even though I don't um, watch a lot of basketball now, it's really about football and soccer. <laughs> um, but I was a basketball statistician and it was all about the turnovers. Um, and, <laughs> and yeah, this is in high school when, um, you know, there, it, there definitely was shaming over who had um, the highest turnovers. But anyway, <laughs> so if you think about sharing this data with fans and the fan experience, tell us also 
about the digital transformation impact, particularly in ticketing. When did, I believe Orlando Magic started on that earlier um, than some of the other teams, but has any of this accelerated in in COVID or what do you think? Yeah, I do think that there's a lot of innovation that has occurred in, in COVID it, across the board on the business side, but in ticketing as well. Um, so yeah, in, in Orlando, and part of this was in our case spurred on by the opening of our new arena. And we were making investments obviously at the time in building a new building and investing in new technologies. And so part of the uh, commitment that our owners and our, our lead executive team had was not just to the physical investments, the building itself, but in investing in capturing data and systems that allowed us to have better insight into our fans, who our fans were. And then also, how do we use that data to inform better business strategies? And this also was the time that Ticketing was disrupted by secondary ticket markets, you know, and, yeah. and kind of the digital transformation and the emergence of uh, ticket sites like StubHub and SeatGeek and, and Vivid. And today there's, you know, dozens of different resale marketplaces that really showcase to teams um, your, your different distribution models, different pr ways of thinking about pricing. And so we we were pretty early adopter of variable ticket pricing and thinking about the value that from a ticket perspective of our games differently based on who, the team that we were playing, the time of the year, um, whether it was early in the season versus later in the season, obviously weekday versus weekend, but just recognizing that the marketplace values these games differently and shows, so should we. Um, not just to optimize revenue, but also better and more accurately reflect the true price of the game so that we can sell maybe a higher volume of tickets to a game that um, otherwise could be overpriced. So those are, I think, for a lot of us in sports, that's where we started, was thinking about variably pricing our tickets. And then it became, how do we dynamically price our tickets? How are we changing pricing as we approach games to reflect you know, the demand situation that we have, or if a team is, uh, an opponent is performing better or worse than we expected and we can raise or lower pricing. I think where data is really helping guide and this, this for us happened before COVID, but it's been accelerated by COVID is product development and thinking about ticketing in new and kind of transformational ways. You know, for a lot of us, the season ticket has always been you sell someone two seats or four seats to every game. Um, and while the data would show very few fans, especially in the NBA and sports where you have a high density schedule where you play a lot of games, aren't coming to every game. So they're then forced to resell their tickets or give their tickets away, or we've developed solutions that allow the fan to give them back to the team. But I think you're starting to see a lot more flexibility built into ticketing solutions and ticketing products that we offer to fans because that is what the market expects. And I think it's been spurred on by COVID. It's been spurred on by brands like Uber and Airbnb and all of these solutions that offer people um, choice and flexibility. And they fans are coming to expect that of the sports teams and entertainment options that they do business with as well. Um, so I, I, I'm excited about that. I think it's another space that we've invested a lot in, but I also think it's a fan centric approach to kind of building a product or a solution that fits what the data shows is more valuable and meaningful to our fans. Yeah. And that pricing optimization, I think is very um, interesting. You also spoke about kind of the before and after being data driven with this. And now maybe you have newer stats or maybe you can't share this, but if you think about how some teams and some businesses are still aspiring to identify the value of data. You quoted a stat about a 20% improvement in ticket revenues after looking at this data. Is that still about right or is that just radically different now? Well, I, I, I would say the jury's still out a little bit okay. in this first, nor <laughs> this first season back to quote unquote normal after um, COVID, but I do yeah. think we, we have seen significant growth in ticketing revenue and improvement in retention of fans as we've introduced, you know, this more sophisticated way of thinking about 
pricing and sales to our business. And you know, my I would venture to guess that most teams that have implemented this are seeing returns as well um, in, in terms of revenue growth and also total tickets sold. Uh, because as I mentioned, yeah, you can capitalize on really high demand opponents, but it also, for us, we play 41 regular season home games. And there are a lot of games that, you know, the price is very affordable and it, we can sell group tickets now and single game tickets, and we can package offerings that are really kind of entry level products um, more effectively while growing, hopefully growing a fan and then selling them a higher price product or a more traditional plan product down the road. Um, so I think that not only have we seen revenue growth, we've seen other metrics as well that um, speak to the value of, of price optimization and revenue management. Great. Thank you, Jake. Wow. 41 games. Charlie, the NFL doesn't have that many games. <laughs> we, we don't, uh, which, which is why I love it. <laughs> Coming from uh, MLS, still had a had a lot of uh, games, still less than the NBA's. But um, you know, coming here with with just uh, eight regular season and then two preseason, uh, definitely uh, less of a uh, folk, um, less of an effort in terms of uh, preparing for the uh, season compared to some of the other leagues. But um, I, I do have to agree with with Jay in terms of you know the the changes that that we're seeing. Um, especially with the COVID, I think it did definitely accelerate the digital transformation of um, using technologies to uh, make it more convenient and safe uh, for the fans attending, whether that's the mobile ticketing or mobile payments, um, that definitely helped. Um, but just to go back in terms of you know, why that's important for many of the professional organization is that you know, for many years, and I think we still have um, some challenges, even just understanding the people that are coming to our venues, right? Yeah. Um, even though they're buying tickets, sometimes we don't have a full understanding of the actual people that are uh, sitting in each of our seats, right? I could have a, I could purchase four tickets for my friends and I come and I just, you know, give out the uh, the paper tickets to everyone, and we all attend. Only information that the club will have is is about me and no one else that we're attending that match. And that's been the challenge that we were trying to solve for many years now. And I think uh, the mobile ticketing has uh, helped in part of that. Right? It certainly hasn't uh, solved 100, percent but at least gave us a little bit more information uh, for us to understand who's actually attending because more people are now. Uh, transferring their tickets easily to their friends uh, through emails or through mobile text, uh, other means to get those tickets out. And in order for them to use them, they have to put their information. So I think that has really helped us uh, get a better understanding of the people that are coming into our uh, uh, stadiums. Yeah. And so that's, and that's been really helpful. I think that's also where you both have said to, to get a complete picture of who is your fan. So, and, and my family is a perfect example. My son is the one who bought the family tickets to one of the NFL games. So, so you don't know that I will be there <laughs> or um, the rest of the family, but is this also where you're bringing in other things like social media um, data or the in-app experiences? Am I buying a Jersey or even a the stadium, what concessions am I buying? How do you how do you marry all that data together? I think identity management is a key topic uh, in sports at this point, just because of the reasons that you've mentioned. We have a variety of different data sources, whether it's a ticketing, merchandising, digital engagements, our website, our apps. There's a lot of information that's coming through. And then we're trying to figure out how do we tie all this together so that we have that clear understanding of that single view of our customers across these touch points. And I don't think this is just a sports industry challenge, right? I think it's a challenge across all industries that manages consumer information. So these are the efforts that we're trying to put in. Um, there's different ways to you know, kind of match the identities using um, different PII information that's collected. But it all starts with just you know, having a uh, standardization across different uh, data collection points in terms of defining, hey, what are the key information that we want to be collecting that allows us to marry these data together across and having the right infrastructure in there as well. 
Anything to add, Jay? No, I, 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 you know, I think Charlie described it well. What in, in? I don't know that this is unique to sports, but it certainly is part of sports. Is we, we all as teams work with technology partners, many different technology partners that have their own systems that provide data back to us and have their own user experience at times. And so I think part of the part of the challenge and the opportunity from a team standpoint is not only collecting the data and kind of stitching it together, the identity management that Charlie described, but making it seamless and as frictionless for a fan as possible. Because I think a fan's expectation is when I'm logging into the Magix app, despite the fact that on the back end they have Ticketmaster as their ticketing partner and Venue Next as their mobile commerce partner and Jens Cam who builds their app and you know Sparks technology which does gamification solution i want kind of a united experience where i'm not constantly having to re-identify and, and log in with you so i think you know the it, it's again it's a good example of the progression which was teams first recognized that Cindy is the same Cindy in these multiple systems and we should unite them and, and kind of treat her holistically based on the knowledge that we have about her. But now it's also thinking about how do we improve the user experience and work hand in hand with partners who really surface what, you know, when you log into our app, what it looks and it feels like. Um, and it's not simply a back end data connection challenge anymore. Um, but that is um, that is a key focal point, I think, across all industries is identity management and, you know, kind of the, the golden record, which you hear all the time, which is just the united understanding of who a fan or who a customer is across all the different interaction points that they may have with you. And even just to, to add to Jay, Jay's point, now we're even looking at into unknown customers, right? So these are customers who might be coming to our websites or our app, but they're not logged in, but we still have the technology to marry them together so that we recognize that, hey, this is an actual season ticket holder who have visited our website, even though they haven't logged in so that we could service right content to relevant offers to them. Yeah, and I think that um, in a way, this shows your background, Charlie, from CPG. But is, if you think about somebody coming to your website and maybe cookies eventually going away and this third party data getting to know your fan, there also is the challenge of privacy and trust. And as we're at the start of the year, I actually put out a prediction that maybe 2022 would be the year that individuals take a little more control of their personal data. Now, if I think about trust, you know, diehard fans, they trust their teams. We're going to share our data with you. But how do you, how do you balance this between maximizing the fan experience, but not crossing, crossing that line? Well, I'll start by saying, I think we are fortunate to work in an industry where fans are more willing to share their data with us. Yes, um, we love but, you. <laughs> yeah, but because there's fans just a different you. relationship with yes. who we are um, than many other industries. But I do think that there's the same expectations do come along, which is um, I am now, I'm giving you something and in return, there's an expectation obviously that you will protect my data and, and store it safely and, and not share it if you've you know, stated that you're not going to share it, but also that now you're going to enrich my experience with you somehow um, and you know, make recommendations about content or products that I might like based on what either I've explicitly told you about, about me or um, you've understood based on my past actions and behavior. Um, so I, 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 in general, I agree with the prediction that you made. Um, and I think it's kind of shifting responsibility to companies to be far more active in how they think about not just data security and data management, but returning value on that expectation that will come from your fans and your consumers. Yeah, I love that, Jay. Returning the value. If you give them something, they're more willing to share. Give them the coupon for that next game or for the favorite jersey. 
merchandise, what have you. But if if they're feeling exploited or they don't really know why um, you have this picture of their data, that's when I think trust is decreased. So right. go ahead, Charlie. No, I actually support the uh, um, stricter kind of privacy policies because I think that's what's going to uh, differentiate those that are really good at value, like managing your customer information and delivering those values versus those organizations that do not. And I think this will actually help those organizations that actually you know, puts more efforts and, and the process in, in place to be able to use the information because at the end of the day, the customers are going to be sharing information with those organizations that they want to get more uh, information back from or more value. So if there is a uh, stricter privacy uh, uh, policies that's put in place, it's only going to help those brands that do deliver those values back to those customers versus those cust- uh, companies that do not. So I think it actually uh, down the line will help us uh, um, with the with the whole kind of uh, execution of our marketing versus those companies that really don't put those right infrastructures in place. Yeah, definitely. So the other aspect that you both have to contend with is the increasing volumes of data, and particularly as maybe at or- Orlando Magic and at the NFL as you've moved to more mobile ticketing, um, and then. In some states, they're talking about in-app betting, if we're allowed to do that, in-app purchases with refreshments delivered to your seat, things like this. How have you contended with the increased data volumes and how has the cloud enabled this? Sure. Um, Well, I think it's a great point. I, I will speak first from where we started, which when we opened Amway Center, we had an on-premise SQL Server data warehouse that- Wait, and what year was this? This was in 2010. Okay. So at the time, at the time, especially for, you know, a a truly a a middle-sized company like ours, the cloud wasn't what it was today and was in many ways cost prohibitive, nor did we have the volume of data that we have today. And so our initial data warehouse was transactional data. It It was ticketing data. It was point of sale data. It did not include the kind of new age and digital data that we have today. So let's fast forward over the last couple of years. And I think a lot of sports teams from talking with other NBA teams and other teams in in different leagues um, have taken kind of the cloud migration process and achieved it in the last couple of years. And we, and we were one of those teams. So we, we now have a cloud data warehouse. We're in a, we're in a snowflake database in an AWS instance. And so we've modernized the technological solution to allow us to have far more um, elasticity and scalability as our volumes of data grow and as we need to scale up kind of the ingestion or analytical computing power that we have. Um, But also I will say just the schema and the, the types of data that we're working with is significantly different today because Mobile app data, um, website data, social media data comes, it's not as clean, it's not as structured. um, (laughs) And there there are a whole new host of challenges that go along with with managing it. And so there's there's certainly an evolution that's taking place, not, not just in the location of the data and the tools that you're using, but also how you're setting up your schema and kind of the relate the relations that different data sets have to one another and how you're architecting kind of your, your data model. Um, but absolutely, I think for, for Charlie and I as, as leaders, kind of as data leaders within our organization is constantly be evaluating the tools, the infrastructure, um, the vendors that you may work with because to ultimately have outcomes, you have to have built correctly. You have to, you know, have a sound warehouse and ensure that the data that you're looking at, the reports that you're looking at are valid and truly informative of what actions you as a business need to take. Now, with that said, you got to have a clear vision and objective in terms of what you want to do, because I think there's an evolution of different technology infrastructures that you want to be thinking about, um, just because 
you know, you, you have the investment or the funds to, to make those investments doesn't mean you got to, you know, go all in at certain infrastructure. Uh, you got to understand, you know, maybe you got to crawl first before you start running or, or, or walking. So I think having that clear understanding is really helpful. We're kind of going through that process as we speak, where we've kind of went from uh, on-premise to uh, more of a productized warehouse that they have used. And now we're going into a very similar environment that Jay mentioned of uh, building our own uh, cloud infrastructure using snowflakes on Azure um, so that we could have that scalability because we so that we could have that flexibility. But because that's where we are from a business standpoint, that's the requirement that we are faced with that allows us to make those investments. So I think it, it kind of needs to be progressed with what you're trying to do from an organization standpoint and make sure that technology is supporting that need. Yeah, so that's really the why. The technology is the how, but it's the why uh, that dri should drive the technology, not the other way around. But you you also both touched on a point Jay, you, you referenced more the technology skills or the way that you would model data, say in Snowflake versus SQL Server or for mobile data coming in is so very different than if it was just one transactional sales fact table, for example. So that the skills of designing differently now have changed, but then it's also the domain expertise. So somebody from one of the other NFL teams um, said to me, so, so Charlie, you going from soccer to football might relate to this. He said, you know, I can get so many great data scientists, but they don't understand the game. <laughs> and so they're having a hard time actually building the analytics that really answer those why questions or the business value. So how are you each managing these skills? And are you finding that it is hard to get good domain expertise? Um, I, I guess it depends how you define the domain expertise. I don't think the sports in itself, especially because we're dealing more on the business, business side, side. Okay. that the domain of the sports um, doesn't have a huge impact. I think it's more about understanding of the business understanding of the customer journeys, understanding of the marketing, I think is important because we do face uh, challenges where, you know, a lot of analysts might have a really good hard skills, coding or SQL or R or Python, but they have a, a limited understanding or experience having uh, worked in a business uh, setting, right? So understanding and being able to extract the insights from the analysis that they've done uh, to be able to provide some recommendations or uh, directions. And that's a hard uh, uh, challenge that we come about because you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, the candidates coming out now have these hard skills, but sometimes they really uh, are limited in terms of having those uh, business skills or soft skills, or even being able to tell a story uh, based on the uh, analysis that they've done. So that's something that we got to continue to work on uh, in, in trying to find uh, good candidates for the, for the analytic roles here. Yeah, I think data storytelling skills is something that is a recurring theme of something that everyone needs to improve upon. Jay, what about you? Well, I think, yeah, and maybe this is a, a bit of a slight pivot, um, but connected. I, what I would tell you about the members of, of our team is, you know, in, in early stages, it was people who had more knowledge on sports, but were good at working with data. And, you know, fast forward to today, we have people on our team who have worked for Disney or casinos or hospitality and tourism companies and are really skilled, you know, data professionals or marketing technology professionals. And, and likewise, we've had people leave our department over years to grow their careers and go to companies like Amazon or General Motors or Disney. And so I think that it, it speaks to the sophistication of sports. We are, um, you know, we are big brands that are still small to mid-sized companies in many ways. And a data professional with the Orlando Magic probably has a wide range of projects that they will be involved with and gets to work with 
different business verticals in ways that will be are exciting and informative because our business includes ticketing, media, marketing partnerships, retail, concessions. You know, these are all business verticals that we have that we're using data to inform our strategies. Um, and so I think people who work in sports get to work in a very wide range. And if you were to leave sports and go to a really big company, you may only work on Disney Cruise Line pricing, for example, right? Like that may yeah. be all you do, um, where, where here you, you could have a little bit more breadth. But I think that the skills um, required to be successful in a job in sports business analytics today are no different than what it would take to be successful working in a major, you know, Fortune 500 company. Um, and to Charlie's point, you know, the days of just being a sports management student who's good in Excel are, um, which, which which maybe be me, for example, right, <laughs> 15 years ago. Um, would would you'd be more challenged to kind of secure a role because you would be competing against people with um, statistics and computer science and analytics uh, undergraduate or graduate degrees in many cases. Yeah, so so fascinating the shift in skills and how it's much more broadly applicable. Um, thank you both for that. Well, I know that listeners would really like me to ask you for predictions on the seasons, but I. <laughs> But I know that you're not going to be allowed to answer that. So let's go with something maybe hopefully that you can answer. A fun fact that surprised you in the data, like maybe, um, you know, where more of the margin or revenues come from or the best um, merchandise thing that surprised you. Is there anything fun about the data that you are allowed to share? You know, I don't, I guess it depends on what you think is fun. I'll tell you, I mean, as, as probably all of us are, are data nerds to some degree on here, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe um, surface a few. So one area that kind of analytics helped us to, to more concretely understand was we had always outperformed our expectations for games in January in Orlando, um, which is not typically for teams like a great month to play home games in. But from a, from a sales perspective, we, we usually do really well and attendance is really strong for those games. And um, what we found was Orlando is one of the top tourist destinations for Bra Brazilians and South um, people traveling from South America. It's their summer. So they're coming to Orlando and they want to see an NBA game. They're kind of indifferent to who it is. They just want to see an NBA basketball game. And so I think it was an example of where as we, as Charlie described earlier, as we really started to understand through digital ticketing, who our fans were, um, where they were coming from, when they were buying their tickets, we now have invested more heavily into digital marketing to, um, to Brazil. We have had ads in Portuguese. We've, you know, revised what some of the creative and messaging of those ticketing ads may look like. We have an incredible group sales team that has a tourism division that sells not just to tourists in market, but to travel planners in kind of the market of origin to get them booked in advance. And so I think it's an example of like where maybe there was an anomaly. And as we studied it from an analytical perspective, like why are January games doing better? If we play the same opponent in January that we played in December or February, why is this doing better? And we've, we've been able to build like a business strategy around it that includes various aspects in different areas. Yeah, that's brilliant. And that shows intuition versus gut feel, because as you were describing that story, I was thinking, oh, it's all the snowbirds in the Northeast wanting Ooh. to go um, South. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, we see those blips and okay. in, in we, we see those too, February and March, we see Canadians and people from the UK, um, you know, we're lucky in Orlando. We, we have, we play in a market where there's 70 million tourists that come here every year, but um, I, whether that's fun and ex fun and exciting to it kind is. of your level of standards, <laughs> yeah, I leave to you, but. <laughs> it is, it is. What about I mean, you, for, Charlie? <laughs> for me, coming from the league, um, I've never had a chance to dive into a lot of the concession data. Um, so when I first got here and started looking into the concession data, there were a lot of interesting things that came out of it. Um, one of the uh, um, 
perception that people had was like, hey, if we reduce the price on our liquor or beer, um, that's going to uh, lower our overall revenues in that category. But then what it what we found out was that we actually encourage more people to drink and there, therefore it actually increased the overall sales um, as well. So those type of small things. And then the other thing that we've uh, kind of looked into was, you know, we've we've changed our uh, pizza partner for the concessions and it was much better quality than before. So we anticipated the sales to go up from the start. But then we noticed the sales actually went down. So we started to dig in deeper and then recognize there were inconsistencies across different uh, areas within the stadiums where this, you know, some sales went up, some went down. So we started to probe a little bit further. And then what we recognized was that the processing of the prepping the pizza was a little bit different than before. And there wasn't enough training or uh, uh, education that was done. So when we actually went back and brought some expertise in and trained them, then from the from there on, the started the sales actually went back up. So, you know, a lot of the the ways that we could use the data to understand a little bit better, and sometimes the solution might not always be a technology or uh, additional data, but just a simple training or uh, additional process to enhance that. Um, so, those are little things that I'm finding within the concession data yeah. uh, as as I get go into a little bit further. What I love about that, Charlie, is I often talk about how um, culture uh, and and data, if it's used to learn rather than to punish, so if it's used to identify and improve processes, the differences in the pizza quality or pizza making. So that's just a great example. Well, you both have been such wonderful guests. Thank you for being on the Data Chief. I always like to close out with one of two questions. You can decide what mood you're feeling in um, if you think back in the last year, something that has either just made you laugh out loud, tears rolling down your cheeks, or what are you most grateful for, um, perhaps beyond the obvious of, of course, health and family? Charlie, you want to lead or you want me to, you want me to, to go? Um, I, no, I could take it. I think the COVID has had a significant impact across the industry uh, for many reasons. Um, certainly, there's been impact to people's jobs and um, the sports in itself, um, but just seeing how we bounce back, um, it what has been uh, phenomenal, just seeing the industry coming together, uh, people coming together. Um, and then just, you know, I, I can't forget the, 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 the excitement and joy of seeing the fans come back to the, to the stadiums. And um, it just shows the role that sports plays. It's not just about you know, generating revenues, but it's delivering that uh, uh, um, you know, love for the games or yeah. supporting the community uh, in your market. And that just um, was really positive and, and kind of going through that time and um, seeing everything just come back to normal, at least partially normal for now. But um, that's been something that was really uh, um, heartwarming to, yeah. to try to see. So true, Charlie. We, we love our sports. We love our sports. What about you, Jay? Yeah, I, um, I I guess I too will take the, you know, what are what are maybe some silver linings or some really positive viewpoints. So, from a sports business industry perspective, it it will be similar in some ways to Charlie's, but I think the level of innovation and inventiveness, creativity that has occurred as an industry. So in the NBA, we closed out, our, our season was interrupted in March of 2020. And we actually closed out that season with our players going to Walt Disney World and playing in what is re referred to as like the Disney bubble. Like they lived for months yeah. in kind of a closed, um, you know, campus on Walt Disney World's property. And that was creative in and of itself. Teams then had to find ways to engage fans. And so we had to lean into digital solutions. Then the next season we played in a reduced capacity. So we, in Florida, we've been able to play games the entire season of 2021, 20% capacity. So we had to reinvent how we thought of our seating manifest and how we sold tickets and how we treated our season ticket holders. And we were able to you know, work through that. And, and now we're, we're more or less back to normal with obviously some restrictions and, and protocols in place. But I think it's just been incredible in, to see how we as an industry 
have um, navigated through that. Likewise, you know, and I would be remiss if I didn't speak to this kind of like being a, a member of the NBA during this period, there has been an incredible social justice movement. And we as a league and our players have been leaders in that space. Um, and it, it makes me proud to be a part of that. And I think speed, sports is a place where there's the power of, of teamwork and community and bringing people together. And it has also been an incredible period to kind of see that. And to Charlie's point, the, the power that sports has, not just in returning and having something to celebrate and um, you know galvanize a community, but also the power to influence change to, uh, to our society. So those are a couple of things that I would speak to from the industry perspective. Yeah, that the players and their families and the team supporting them definitely sacrificed a lot living in this bubble for so long, as many others have, have dealt with. Um, thank you both so much for being guests on The Data Chief. Thank you for the opportunity. It's, it's fun to talk about this with you. Same here. Thanks for having us.